Activato. Okay, so uh, today we'll talk about two architects, uh, Charlotte Perion, French, and Dominicus Böhm, German. So let's start with uh, Charlotte Perion. A card carrying communist. She was a card carrying communist. Wow. For uh, Romanians, this is not a good thing. <laughs> we hate communism, but, but there were some important intellectuals who were proud communists, even uh, Picasso, even Jean Paul Sartre. And now we learn that even uh, Charlotte Perion. But what they imagined about communism was different from what we went through, at least uh, partially. Anyway, here she was, uh, this uh, very important architect and designer who tried to convince Le Corbusier that she was worthy of attention. And Le Corbusier, with his uh, masculinism in a way, Initially, he dismissed her, and then uh, when she insisted and so on, she initially she, he dismissed her because he said to her, you know, we don't hire, uh, you, you could only work with the textiles and, um, you know, like interior design and so on. It was a misconception on the, from, from Le Corbusier, actually, but uh, he changed his mind afterwards and he hired her. And it seems that some of his furniture was actually designed by this lady, this communist with a card, um, Charlotte Perion. Uh, but uh, those pieces of, of furniture, very important, uh, you know, they they are they are they acknowledge uh, well. They used to acknowledge only Le Corbusier himself. In the meantime, uh, in the present. Uh, People know that Charlotte Perion had a very important role in, in his office. So let's read a little bit. Charlotte Perion, you see, she was born on October 24th, 1903, and died on, in October 27th in 1999. So she lived a long life, 96 years. She was a French architect and designer. Her work aimed to create functional living spaces in the belief that better design helps in creating a better society. I like this. So she had social concerns, not only aesthetical. In her article, L'Art de Vivre from 1981, she states, the extension of the art of dwelling is the art of living, living in harmony with man's deepest drives and with his adopted or fabricated environment. Charlotte Perion, the design visionary who survived Le Corbusier's put downs, which I refer to that indeed Le Corbusier tried to put her down and she insisted, she insisted in the end he hired her and um, in the end she proved herself even after, or maybe even more after the death of Le Corbusier. But here they are together. Uh, you know, the kind of strangely looking uh, Le Corbusier on the left, of course, and on the right, the young, uh, the much younger uh, um, Charlotte Perion. Perion on her chaise longue basculant in 1928. So let's see again, she was born in uh, 1903. So in 1928, she was 25 years old. And it seems she designed actually this uh, famous chaise longue, which is, uh, you know, uh, known as being designed by Le Corbusier, but um, some research and some efforts from some people seem to say that actually it was mainly designed by this lady by Charlotte Perion. So we see her here without seeing her face, a 25, uh, you know, testing uh, the famous chaise longue by uh, Le Corbusier. Well, with a question mark. Miami Beach House. Um, the truth is, you know, there were important ladies in architecture and design uh, who are not, or were not sufficiently acknowledged. 
Some of them wives of architects, like uh, the two wives that Alvaralto had, uh, and, 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 and they lived in the shadow of the famous husband, but they had an important role in, 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 in the activity of the famous husband. So, you know, uh, lately uh, the role of, of these women is beginning to uh, be acknowledged in a more and more, um, you know, truthful and uh, uh, significant way. This is a Miami Beach house that she designed, but uh, this was rebuilt by a famous, I think uh, Armani rebuilt it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so it, this is a new building based on the plans, the drawings of Charlotte Perion. Uh, it was built in Miami uh, uh, and it is an homage to her. An interesting building indeed. And uh, I'm glad that it was rebuilt. Uh, well, it's it's a showcase now, but uh, imagine that you know at one point uh, a similar building, if not an ide identical building, was was not just a showcase; it was actually used. She loved wood, and we are, we are going to see the, the the presence of wood in in in. in some of his her works, but she also loved metal, and she 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 was able to be even futuristic in her designs. Uh, the, the the furniture here was uh, designed by her, but was rebuilt, as I said. I think Armani rebuilt this uh, uh, this building by uh, after her death. If you are interested, if you like her work, you can purchase a lamp designed by Charlotte Perion. You can find them on eBay. They're not so expensive. Some of them were, were mass produced by Philips. Um, you know, uh, nice, uh, nice pieces actually. Now, I don't know if those uh, clothes belong to her or not. Maybe they are just a decor to show, you know, uh, to mimic the, 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 the use of the building. Uh, look at this. This is, uh, you know, uh, in a way, uh, Le Corbusier invention, but maybe, maybe she designed it too. Uh, the idea to have a, a bulb you know, just a, you know, a blank bulb, if I can say so, you know, uh, at the end of a, you know, metallic piece that brings the electricity in is an interesting one, I think. This is the power of art and this is the power of architecture. If something is done, you know, uh, significantly, uh, sooner or later, even if the building is destroyed, it might be rebuilt by someone who is sympathetic towards uh, your efforts. And, uh, you know, I like this continuity and the fact that there is a conjunction of efforts, that you had a designer architect who designed the building, then later on a famous designer comes in with the power of uh, fame and money and rebuilds the building. So there is a continuum and uh, even a, you know, some kind of a collaboration over time. Now, why it was built in Miami and not in France, I don't know, but it's good that it was rebuilt. So we can have a a glimpse at the at the work of, um, of of Charlotte Perion. I like also this idea, you know, to have a secondary bed that slides underneath the you know the the storage space or the cabinets. It's a good idea if you have um, you know guests. You have an additional bed which conveniently can uh, come out uh, from underneath the, you know, the, the storage space. I like even these chairs, you know, these uh, 
you know, so-called archaic or primitive, uh, you know, just some pieces of wood, but um, why not? They might not be the most comfortable things on earth, but it's okay. Charlotte Perion, a fresh spirit. She loved the mountains. We are going to see a hotel she built and also uh, a refuge, uh, futuristic building, which could find its place on, on the moon as well. Les Arc, 1800, this is the building, it's, it was not built in, 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 in 1800s, but it was built in the 20th century. Maybe that's the number of the build, I mean, the number on the street, if there is a street. This is the building, she loved, she loved the mountain, and we are going to see many, many pictures of this building, because I was lucky to, or unlucky, to find a, a link a website which uh, had a detailed, uh, you know, review of the building. It's a good building, you know, it's, uh, you know, maybe not uh, extremely, you know, it's not really shocking, but uh, the fact that it is uh, slanted and uh, also the, the land, the earth is also slanted, uh, it creates this uh, strange, perhaps, uh, visual effects. Charlotte Perion, and she did this, you know, after, after some good years, uh, you know, after Le Corbusier died. I think Le Corbusier died in 1965, if I'm not mistaken. Swimming towards the sun in the Mediterranean Sea. Some people uh, seem to think that he committed suicide, but we don't know. He was swimming at 78 towards south, towards the sun, when he had, a, I don't know, a heart attack and, uh, you know, he died in his beloved uh, Mediterranean Sea, not far away from his... Uh, beautiful, in my opinion, Le Cabanon, which in my opinion is more important as architecture than Villa Savoie. I know some people would protest, but that's what I think and feel. But he is celebrated for Villa Savoie, which I think is a rather, for my taste, a, a little bit a frigid building uh, with its excessive whiteness. Even uh, Bernard Chumi criticized um, the Villa Savoie you know, uh, Villa Savoie was almost demolished and it was neglected and vandalized and abandoned immediately after the war. And uh, Bernard Chumi said in one of his manifestos, what is the most, architect the most architectural thing about this building, I'm talking about Villa Savoie, is the state of neglect it is or it was in. Anyway, this is perhaps also the maybe predictable in a way um, protest of the son against the father. Now, of course, Le Corbusier was not the father of, of Bernard Chumi, but professionally, so to speak, in a way he was, as he was the father of many people, maybe including uh, Charlotte Perion. Again, I'm talking about um, the, the, profession, the father figure. Anyway, this is the building by, we are going to see other pictures um, by, uh, of this uh, building by Charlotte Perignon. As I said, she loved the mountain. And uh, now we, we, we arrive at an inside, uh, insider's tour of the French ski resort Charlotte Perignon designed in the 60s and 70s. Well, I, maybe she began it while uh, Le Corbusier was still alive, but she was not working for him any longer. Anyway, we are going to see many pictures. This building is not, uh, you know, I mean, it could have been perhaps designed by someone else, but it was designed by Charlotte Perion. Um, I like this. I don't know exactly what the function of this is. Is it a chapel of some sort or I don't know. Uh, she designed both this building and this one. And now views of the inside of the building. She was in good measure uh, an interior designer, but uh, an architect does everything, you know, does object design, does interior design, does urbanism, 
uh, there's uh, buildings, you know, it's, it's no, not a contradiction. And uh, now I don't know if she designed this piece here, maybe she did. She didn't design, design this lamp either, you know, I used to have such a lamp and, you know, many architects and students had it. It's a famous classic design for someone laboring at the drafting board. But she designed probably this, you know, uh, what I know of her designs, this is, you know, you can almost make something like this of uh, what is called in Romanian palettes, you know, uh, well, the round pieces of wood uh, you have to procure from somewhere else, but otherwise, and you need two pillows and that's it. It works, at least to an extent. kitchenette, you know, equipped uh, properly, probably there in the mountain, a lamp, maybe she designed this lamp, kind of interesting, you know, is uh, with the light emanating on the sides and through another rather narrow space. The door, a door, she loved the, the, the circle as well, Charlotte Perriot. What I see here in the foreground reminds me a little bit of, a, of the school that uh, Jean Renaudie, a countryman, uh, designed at uh, Ivry sur Seine. Another door or doorway. And I like the fact that, you know, it's, it's, you can see how it was made in a way. And, you know, the fact that the piece of wood also has cracks, it's okay. I don't think it's a scene. The truth is, as an architect, you can invent, you know, from the smallest detail to the largest building, there is room for creativity, a staircase and, you know, door handles or anything you can yeah, if you love architecture, you can manifest that love in so many ways. Interesting, this space inside, you know, it's too bad that the picture I found is a little bit slanty to the left. But um, I also like the fact that she was not shy to, you know, paint. Well, maybe some people would say it's sacrilegious to paint wood and to paint it in blue, but, uh, I don't know. I, I, I like this interior here. I don't like very much the picture, but uh, I mean, I like the picture, but I don't know why the photographer didn't see that it's falling a little bit to the left, but maybe I'm too pedantic. This is also, this could have been almost a detail in a building by Alvaralto, almost. It's not bad, you know. Uh, the whiteness of uh, probably concrete or masonry even is possible and, 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 and the brownness of wood. And there is a little bit of, you know, symphony here. Well, maybe the word is too generous, symphony. It's a little bit of something musical here. As it is also here, you know, there are these ramps which are kind of interesting. I don't know because I, I didn't have, I didn't see the plans of the building and the sections. I should have searched for them, but I didn't. But what I see here is also interesting, you know. Um, you know, maybe some kind of an inside or interior mountain or mound within the building. Then colors, you know, well, 60s and 70s, that's the spirit. You know, there is optimism here and colors, uh, you know, uh, doesn't look like, a, you know, uh, an elitist building. It looks like a building uh, with a, that 
it looks like the building of a French architect who had the, the card of a communist. I, I, I see some communal concerns here and I'm actually happy because I think architects often sell their soul for the very rich because that's where the money comes from. So I don't think there are so many architects uh, well, there were in the past, but uh, since the collapse of communism in 1989, I don't think too many architects entertain, you know, communistic um, ideals or longings. Uh, we see here a French lady, you know, uh, who was a communist with a car. Interesting. It only shows she actually had a genuine desire you know for uh, for serving society at all strata at all levels and not just the rich not only the elite not only the bankers not only the great financiers not only the big corporations and so on but real people you know uh, and and i like this i wish uh, there were more, more architects like this even that might mean building less It's a good building, I would say. Maybe not very, very spectacular, but it's okay. What is spectacular is the mountain. The mountains are magnificent. They are beautiful. And why should the building compete with them? No, it shouldn't. Now, a mountain shelter, a refuge, the refuge or refuge tonneau, as it is called. This is, a, you know, like a full scale model. And it was meant also for the mountains, you know, something to be, you know, uh, placed, you know, in, in various locations, you know, in the mountains, a refuge. Uh, the interior is also interesting. You know, it, it's, everything is designed. And there were, of course, buildings built like this pavilions like this, you know, um, refuge or otherwise, you know, I can think of Buckminster Fuller, but not only him. Anyway, it's also interesting, this conjunction between wood and metal. And uh, everything inside is made in order to maximize the, maximize the space as much as possible. In other words, to use the space as much as possible. And I think she was successful. I, I don't know if I remember correctly, but I think she made this building to accommodate 16 people or so, and it's very, very small. Uh, but look, it's everything is very creative, you know, and uh, yeah, here we have the this strange thing, so to speak, industrial looking. Uh, you look at the building and the background, and then you look at this thing that Charlotte Perion did. And then, um, ah, no, I was wrong, not 16, eight, from eight to 10, but still, you know, I mean, this was small. I mean, was uh, maybe the diameter when we see the silhouette of that man is, uh, you know, four meters you know, to, to be able to accommodate eight people or 10, even uh, in that very small uh, concentrated, this is, uh, you know, concentrated architecture, so to speak, literally speaking. Yeah, here is the plan. I mean, you see the, the door, you know, which is, yeah, it's something for, uh, you know, very efficient you now to bring aid to save from the, you know, the, the difficulties of a cold climate, uh, eight, to, eight, eight to 10 people. And again, I think a generous idea. And she did. Here she is in a, you know, rather provocative uh, picture, but it shows that she loved the mountains. And here is the refuge.
this is this is something that I, I would like to underline that an architect, even he, if he or she doesn't have commissions, no one can stop you from uh, thinking, from drawing, from writing. You know, you can invent your own raison d'etre. And uh, the creative architects always, always did this. Le Corbusier didn't have commissions for almost 10 years. And he worked, he wanted to revolutionize, as you know, Paris. And so he worked on uh, La Ville Radieuse. Frank Lloyd Wright worked for Broadacre City, also for almost 10 years because the uh, Puritanistic North Americans didn't uh, like his uh, rom so-called romantic escapades that he left to his wife and his children and went with uh, someone's wife to Italy and then North America punished him and then you know he had no or he didn't have as many commissions as he used to so he worked for Broadacre City so you know if you love architecture, you work with commissions or without commissions. You can work on competitions, although Frank Lloyd Wright didn't like to work for competitions. In fact, he was very proud of saying, I don't like doing competitions because I cannot allow a committee, meaning the jury, to decide if my work is good or not. <laughs> and uh, I see the point, indeed. Um, Nice, nice piece of work here that Charlotte Perriand did, you know. It is, it is, and I'm sure it brought her uh, satisfaction, you know, because, you know, she designed everything. It's a microclimate uh, here, micro universe. Everything, every square inch is important, you know, to bring in eight to 10 people. Uh, they would have had fun, I'm sure. And this is, you know, here, just here, you, 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 you can house, I mean, you know, for sleeping, uh, I see here two almost like tatamis. I don't know. I mean, one, two, three, four, maybe here five, five people at the top and then at the bottom, uh, other three. Maybe we should all live like this, you know, then we will not ravish the earth with our giant mansion, mansions and all the rest, all that nonsense, which kills nature. Uh, but for this, you need a different conception about life, you know, indeed more communistic, but joyously so. I, I, I think she also, uh, she was a, uh, I don't know if she was a hedonist, but uh, I think she enjoyed life and uh, that's why uh, the gods or God granted her a very long life. Uh, you know, not dying at 96 or so. Anyway, C.H. Pivoton, Musée des Arts Décoratifs, Paris, 1927. So this used to be known as being designed by Le Corbusier. Well, apparently Charlotte Perion designed it. Uh, is it nice? I don't know. I mean, you know, aesthetically, maybe it's not very, very impressive, but uh, it is a C.H. Pivoton. 1927, then Chaiselong by Charlotte Perion and Le Corbusier. Can you imagine? Her name is placed in front of Le Corbusier's name. Uh, this is uh, probably a more recent uh, naming. Uh, in fact, we talked about Villa Savoie. Well, we are looking at a picture with Villa Savoie, the interior of, of Villa Savoie. And uh, this is a well-known, you know, furniture piece within the villa, a chaiselongue by Le Corbusier and Charlotte Perion, or should we say Charlotte Perion and Le Corbusier? Uh, this happened also with Miss Van der Rohe. Miss Van der Rohe had a, a lady friend, so to speak. They were lovers for many years. Lily Reich, who also designed Apparently, she designed the, you know, the furniture uh, for the uh, Barcelona Pavilion and, uh, you know, some pieces of furniture that Miss apparently designed were actually designed by uh, Lily Reich. And uh, when they broke off, uh, the activity of a great designer of Miss ended. 
you know. And so, you know, there were these ladies in the shadow who were very important in the in the career, in the in the in the trajectory of a, you know, we are talking about stars, you know, the Corbusier and Miss Panteroy. Uh, but uh, they didn't work alone, and sometimes the women in the shadow did much more than it was acknowledged. Interior design, furniture of Charlotte Perion. Let's look at it. Um, so these were clearly, you know, her work. Independently, she worked here from uh, Le Corbusier. I don't know for how many years she worked with Le Corbusier. I don't know, maybe 10 years or I, I don't know. I should not add a number, but she had a long life. So, you know, she created uh, outside of uh, the sphere of influence of um, her more famous uh, uh, father figure. Lamp designs, as I mentioned, this actually I found myself on eBay. You could have bought it for $60 or so. Um, yeah, if you like it, you can offer it to, uh, as a present to someone or to yourself. Uh, you can uh, you can find it. Uh, just type in lamp Charlotte Perion, and uh, this these were produced for Philips um, in, in the Netherlands, so mass produced. This is another lamp by her. Um, so yes, when you are when you have uh, imagination and uh, passion for architecture and design and so on, even if you don't build them, no one can stop you from making the design, making the projects. This is nice in its simplicity, actually. Charlotte Perion. The same lamp we saw before, but with a bulb, uh, <laughs> a special bulb, it seems. Now, furniture designs, uh, you know, shelves for books. Uh, nice, maybe not, you know, extremely spectacular, but they show sensitivity, there is colorfulness. Uh, there are some cantilever parts there, which probably wouldn't admit to too many books there, but it depends. Uh, the whole kitchen. Small, communistic in a way, prefabricated and uh, ready to be used, to be transported wherever there was a need. Chair design. Here is uh, one of them. Um, bad, actually. And I like the slight asymmetry. It is sym sym symmetrical, but not uh, totally. This one we saw. This one rotates, it's pivot on. This one is uh, so interesting. Of course, it needs uh, some some kind of uh, cushions there because, you know, otherwise <laughs> you might not be able to get up if you try to sit on that thing, but uh, it's cold, I would say. Charlotte Perriot, <clears throat> objects and furniture design. Uh, you know, the, this is the cover of a book on her, here we see it's a it's a variation of the so-called, you know, Le Corbusier chaise long. L'aventure japonaise, like other modern architects, she was, um, you know, uh, 
appreciative of, of Japan and Japan in return was appreciative of her. So I think that the, 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 I think she even lived in, if I remember now, uh, lived for a few years in Japan. She had a tumultuous life in a way. Uh, I should uh, renew my knowledge about her life a little bit, maybe for the next presentation. Okay, and now we go to a very different architect, uh, the German uh, Dominicus Böhm. Uh, about whom I would have liked to talk yesterday, but we'll talk today better later than never. Dominicus Böhm, 1818-1955. So he lived for a few, year, few, few years than Charlotte Perriot. Let's read Dominicus Böhm, born on October 23rd, 1880, and died in August 6th, 1955. So he died 10 years before Le Corbusier was a German architect specializing in churches. He built churches in Cologne, the rural area, Swabia, and Hesse. Many of his buildings are examples of brick expressionism. Expressionism is not very fashionable now, these days, but I think expression is both in art and architecture cannot be neglected. He was also the father of Gottfried uh, Böhm, who uh, received the Pritzker Prize in architecture, <laughs> talking about long lives. He was 100 and something, one, maybe 102 years old or so when he died. I'm talking about his son, Gottfried, Sam, uh, Gottfried Böhm. Here was the man, interesting looking, a little bit exalted, but how else could you be if you build churches, especially in the expressionist mode? Um, I like expressionism actually, both in art and architecture. And the famous German expressionist movement, Die Brücke, the, the bridge, had, uh, you know, as, as members of the group, uh, people who, I think they studied uh, some, some time in architecture schools, just like the Pink Floyd members. St. John the Baptist in the New Ulm in Germany, 1926. So let's see how old was he. He was 36 years old when he designed St. John the Baptist in New Ulm. And here is the building, uh, you know, for us, you know, surviving the onslaught of postmodernism, we, we could easily say this is a, almost a postmodern building. Well, it was built in 1926, and uh, I, I think it's a good building, you know, with the uh, touches or, or traces of um, the Gothic, uh, Gothic uh, sensibility, or at least some Gothic or Gothicist details, but um, I think uh, it's not a bad building. It's a little bit, uh, it's an early building by him. You will see more radical designs for churches that he arrived at. Dominicus Böhm, a very different architect from Charlotte Perignon, that's for sure. I don't know if he designed also this, you know, what is in front of the, of the, of the, of the building. Maybe, maybe in collaboration with a sculptor, it's possible. In, in the case of churches, the conjunction of, uh, of the works of uh, artists and architects uh, is uh, very welcome. But look at the ceiling, the roofing, the structure of the building. This is a modernistic interpretation of the Gothic. And I think it's very noble and is in, enticing for the eye. And uh, it's creative. What else can we say? He was 36 when he built this in 1926. Not bad. Dominicus Berg. 
I, you, you don't need explanations or uh, descriptions or I don't know what in order to, even if that, that cross was not there, he will say this is a church. And this is the place of worship. You know, the, the um, uh, architecture can speak without words. And in this case, it does. Another one, I hesitate to pronounce it, but I guess it's not too difficult. Chris Koenig in uh, Bishop Shine in 1925. So it was actually built one year before the previous one. This one also is rather interesting. It's, uh, you know, uh, modern in the sense that it is, a, you know, uh, almost austere. But then there is the brickwork, which is not, is not employed in a cold way. And then the rhetorics of the entrance, the brickwork, you know, which announce you that, uh, announces you that, you know, you are entering in a, in a special place, a church, the house of God. Brick, as always, is a great friend of, of, of the architect and Frank Lloyd Wright was totally right this time, although those who worked for him or with him or studied with him sometimes used to joke uh, by changing his name from Frank Lloyd Wright to Frank Lloyd Wrong. Uh, so Frank Lloyd Wright, not Frank Lloyd Wrong, uh, used to say, uh, um, give me a brick and I will transform it into its equivalent in gold. Because indeed a brick is, uh, is magical in the right hands, in the right hands of someone like Wright. Maybe even uh, in the right hands of someone like Wrong. Anyway, um, uh, this makes me think a little bit about uh, another expressionist architect whom I admire, Fritz Höger, who built uh, with bricks some uh, interesting buildings, including the church, which I have in mind now, but I don't have a picture of now. But look at this, you know, this is Uven architecture. It's, it's, it's symphonic, you know, I used the second time, maybe in this case, a little more uh, justifiable. It's, it's sensitive, it's this fragmentation and this coming together of all these bricks, you know, uh, special bricks, you know, this, I mean, you know, it would be a crime to hide this behind plaster. Of course not. Brick is, 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 is convincing and beautiful if it is shown, it, if it is exposed. And uh, all good architects knew this. We see the narrative and well, an abstract narrative, if it is a narrative at all, but we see the fragmentation of glass and the fragmentation of the brickwork. So it's not just a blank, blank and blunt you know, surface, it's, it's, it's made of small parts. So, um, you know, not everywhere, like here, yes, is a more typical kind of brickwork, but even here we have, you know, various kinds of, of brick, you know, with the different uh, colors even, you know, inserted uh, in an aleatory way, but to, to make the, the world vibrate a little bit, you know, and uh, I think it works. It's, it, it, you, you can bring in some impressionism to the world, you know, so it's not, it's not, you know, uh, perfectly, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, these so-called imperfections, uh, these accidents uh, add to the life of the world. And I think that's a good thing. Now the interior is a little bit different, but um, in terms of space and in terms of, you know, how he configured the, the interior is, is still interesting and, 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 and modern actually, but, but the modernism that Dominicus Böhm used is not divorced from, uh, you know, suggestions of a certain past. Look at the plan, you know, it's, it's very simple. 
it's it's uh, it's pure in a way, uh, but it's also musical. It's not, it's not just you know uh, prosaic uh, plan uh, generating a prosaic building. No, there is an architect at work here, who, like Eufalinos, uh, longed for uh, creating a singing building. That that is uh, architecture. I really feel like caressing brick, you know, because it's earth, it's us actually, you know, I, I am a brick in a way, I wish I was a brick, a brick in a, in a good brick, brick building. Louis Carnes, you know, he even talked with the bricks, you know, he said, I, um, I don't know if he, he was asked or he asked himself, you know, uh, I asked the brick what it wants to be, and the brick said, I want to be an arch. Another church, St. Engelbert in Cologne, in Köln, 1928-1932, so a little bit later. Uh, here it is, very different. And uh, yes, rhetorically needs uh, symmetry, but we cannot say that it is a building that leaves you indifferent. No, it's, it's, it's architecture. You might not like this so-called style of architecture, but um, it cannot leave you indifferent, no. Uh, these are variations uh, on a Gothic theme, but it's a, still a, it's a modern building. It's a, it's a building uh, built less than 100 years ago and not 800 years ago, not in the Middle Ages. It belongs to the 20th century. But if you build a, such a building today, it would stand out still through its, uh, I could almost say, sensuous uh, austerity. An interesting architect, Dominicus Böhm. Now, I don't know how it would have been or how it was to be the son of this man. You know, I, if his son studied architecture, and I think he had, yeah, he had several sons because I saw a picture of Gottfried Böhm together with uh, two or three brothers. So they are all the sons of, um, of this man, of Dominicus Böhm. And I think there was another architect, at least another one. So yes, when you have a father like Dominicus Böhm and you see him working for these churches and creating these buildings, it's rather to be expected to want to become an architect as well, because he was inspired by the work of the father. It must be very nice now for a child to see the father laboring at, on the drafting board and creating interesting buildings and shapes and, you know, culture, books. I like to imagine, but I'm sure here we are talking about a cultivated family. You know, uh, it's possible that even the father of Dominicus Böhm was an architect. That I do not know. But if, if, if architecture started in that family with Dominicus, still, I think it was a, you know, a climate of creativity. And uh, I guess it was, it was damaged in the Second World War, in the deadly Second World War, you know, which obviously Mr. Putin uh, doesn't uh, think about, you know. It, 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 I, I just don't understand. I don't understand how after the horrors of the Second World War, we still learn nothing. I, I don't understand. I don't understand. And look at this beautiful drawing. You know, it, it's an atmospheric drawing. It's, it's just a suggestion of, uh, of the atmosphere of the building. And it shows clearly that Dominicus Böhm was a, was a lyricist in architecture, was a lyrical architect. The geometry he used was strong, was clear cut, 
but this drawing shows a very sensitive artist and uh, you have to be in order to be a good architect. Stella Maris on the island of Northern 1931. Now, I don't think he did hear everything. Actually, when I look at, no, well, it's, it's in a very good uh, shape and I'm sure it was refurbished and so on. Uh, I think he did only this part, which is very interesting. This almost looks like the architecture of Alvaro Siza. This part probably was built later, or I don't know. Uh, this intrigued me, uh, this building. I think he did just a uh, part, maybe this one. But the fact that it inspired uh, the growth of the building, uh, this also testifies uh, about the, the power of art, good art and good architecture to, you know, to uh, reverberate. And yeah, the, the, so he only did this. And then the addition was done, I don't know by who. But this is, you, do, you wouldn't expect this building from the author of the previous building that we saw. So this shows clearly the versatility of uh, Dominicus Böhm. Uh, re really, this building, if this building was built now, you know, Arch Daily uh, would publish it. If this building was built by uh, Alvaro Siza, everybody would say, sure, it's an Alvaro Siza building. Well, it's not. It, it was built by Dominicus Böhm and uh, 90 years ago. Interesting work. Look how dated this building is compared to this one. I mean, this is resolutely modern, you know, so much so that again, it could have been built now. And it was built almost 100 years ago, 90 years ago. This was not built by him anyway. Um, and it is very well kept. And that's why maybe additionally, it looks so contemporary. Another Kirche, another church in Dillman. Well, this is Teutonic. It's, uh, it's uh, Teutonic and Tectonic. It's, it's heavy. It's, uh, you know, uh, potent architecture, you know, in its uh, solidity. Maybe it's not so interesting in terms of, uh, you know, what we expect. The, the previous one was a little bit more engaging for us today. But uh, this one also cannot be, I think, uh, dismissed in its simplicity, in its uh, Teutonic simplicity. And the interior is uh, surprising, you know, this uh, pure space, you know, this uh, luminous large box with white walls and brownish benches. And uh, it has nobility, I would say. It must be nice to, to, to build churches, you know, to, uh, if you can assert your creativity, because, you know, it's, the, it's actually, you know, the, the, the ultimate client, you know, God himself. And, you know, I mean, what could compete with that? I don't know where this is. This looks maybe it's a part of the same building, but um, not everything is immensely gracious. It is a little bit um, you know, conveniently heavy, and uh, but in its simplicity, it has a certain modernity which would not have been. Uh, even in Germany would not have been. I mean, after all, in Germany, you can even find uh, Rococo buildings, which have a different spirit. But uh, Dominicus Böhm was an architect uh, who built for uh, God uh, in, uh, 
modern way, but not in an irresponsibly modern way. St. Camillus Church. Uh, again, I like the, I like this brickwork and the 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 the, the playfulness, you know, uh, of, of, of allowing the skin of the building to have uh, uh, accidents. You know, uh, uh, this this shows that he was not dogmatic. And 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 look, you know, it, it's the building is, seems to murmur uh, some uh, some something it, 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 it's almost like the, the the world wants to become world you know we we are not yet at the world the world is not yet uh, configured or derived at. but but the world seem, the world seems to whisper something and uh, yeah, but the, the plan is, uh, you know, uh, disarmingly uh, simple, almost simplistic. But the building, you know, has uh, has personality. And uh, again, the way he worked with, and 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 you see that there there is a the 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 whispers of the bricks if I am to call them so, amplify towards the top of the building as it should be. So you begin with the, almost the absence of whispers and words and longing for them. And then the more you go with the building upwards, the more the world almost seems to want to dematerialize and to whisper. So there is a crescendo here, which I think it's inspiring. Now the geometry of the building is still uh, as it is, you know, but he tried to problematize it through through this brickwork. Interesting. He was experimenting, you know. He was like any creative architect. He was he was searching for something, you know. He was uh, he was alive, in other words. Nice to have such a father. I, again, I, I fantasize now. I feel inspired to imagine how it was in their house, you know. Or the father coming from work, you know, maybe with some books, uh, you know, uh, uh, in his hand or under his arm and, uh, you know, uh, playing maybe an instrument and the children, you know, uh, seeing drawings by the father and the, it, it's culture, it's intellect, it's sensitivity, it's art. We don't need cars, we don't need highways, we don't need all the misery of the so-called, uh, you know, civilization. We need sensitivity, creativity, good books, good music, good conversations. And the father who is creative and gives a, a nice example of the children to the sons or daughters. St. Joseph's Church. Uh, again, you know, a building with a simple geometry plan, but this one has an interesting part in the main elevation, meaning the Western elevation with the entrance, which is here. Uh, you know, the way he connects these two sides with these uh, arches, there is some kind of a Romanesque architecture here with the um, touches of, uh, the Germanic spirit, but it's powerful. It's um, you know, it's 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 not uh, it's not this building is not uh, willing to you know uh, submit itself to the first wind that blows over it. Now it's about the stability of of faith and of God. And, uh, you know, there, there aren't too many Hamletian uh, doubts here. Although I wonder what is this here and on the left, you know, it almost reminds me of some positive erosions, as I call them, in the work of Carlos Carpa. Was this done intentionally? I don't know what it is here, but I look only at it now. Uh, or it was just um, a piece of the uh, building fell off. I, I don't know. The, the interior is impressive. 
you know, uh, uh, it's impressive. Good work, Dominicus Berman. I'm happy that I had the occasion to, to present some of your works. And, 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 and again, you see, you look at the plan and, and you don't expect, you know, such a rich architecture from this plan because, because we think mainly, you know, in terms of um, what we expect from, from a plan, you know, to generate white walls. And, but, but here we see something else. And yes, the bricks uh, assert themselves with the, with the worms. Uh, the vivaciousness of the earth, you know, they are vertical, they are, yeah, vertical, uh, vertical um, slices of the earth, if I am, I'm not sure I found the right words now. But uh, all in all, uh, Dominicus Berm is teaching us a serious lesson about architecture and uh, church architecture. There is structure, of course, but there is also the ornament. He doesn't use a lot of ornaments, if at all, but, but, but in the playfulness of the bricks, there is an implicit, more or less discreet kind of ornamentation. Otherwise, the building lives mainly because of its tectonic qualities. Now, the grave of Dominicus Berm in Cologne or uh, Köln, and I think this is the last image of this um, presentation. He deserves a more ample one, maybe next year. This is the, you know, the, the gravestone of, of, uh, of this, uh, I would say, remarkable architect, uh, Dominicus Berm. Thank you.